Hello and welcome to Ask a Curator Day at TMAG. Um, my name's Kath and I work with the museum's communications team. Um, now, as we begin, I'd like to invite you to join me in paying respect to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community as the traditional and original owners and continuing custodians of the land on which we're standing today and acknowledge elders past and present. Now, we're here today at the Rosny Collections and Research Facility to talk to our Senior Curator of Invertebrate, Invertebrate Zoology, Dr Simon Grove. So, welcome Simon. Thank you, Kath. Thanks for the invitation. Great. Now, uh, today it's Ask Your Curator Day uh, on social media all around the world and museums are inviting people to ask their curators all their burning questions. So, you can send us your questions um, now throughout this broadcast in the comments. Um, and we've also got some questions ready to go. So, Simon, are you ready to jump in? Let's go for it. Great. Okay, let's start with an easy one. Uh, what's your role at TMAG? Um, my job title is called Senior Curator of Invertebrate Zoology. Um, that really means I'm in, in, looking after the entire collections of all the invertebrates that we keep at the museum. So in, by invertebrates I mean the creepy crawlies, the seashells, all those animals that don't have a backbone basically. Um, in the trade we say it's the other 99% of animal life. <laughs> so it's a very diverse group, they can be marine, freshwater, terrestrial, and my job is to look after the collection, to build it, to um, make it available for research and so on. Great. And so, how did you come to work here? How did you become a curator? Um, it's a bit of a, a long journey, but I've always had those tendencies. I, I, even at an early age, I think the age of eight, I had a seashell museum in my bedroom, <laughs> which was open to the public. Right. Um, and mo most of the jobs I've had since then have involved collecting natural history items of some sort. And um, I actually started working for the museum about eight years ago. I was very lucky to, to get the position because um, the previous incumbent had been there for five decades. So the jobs don't come up very often, but when it did, I was ready and had been there ever since. Great. All right. Um, so, uh, what advice would you have for people who want to become curators? How do you become a curator? It, it's, um, it's not an easy journey. Um, I think you definitely have to be very passionate and pretty committed to um, wh where you want to be. But I would say you have to be committed to the discipline rather than to being a curator, because um, for me as, as a zoologist, I've worked in many zoological positions before I got this curator's position. You can do training, you can do degrees in museology, but I think it's better to, do, to follow your passions and follow a profession that will enable you to be potentially a good curator if the job comes up. And so are there any particular qualities that a, a curator mm. needs to have? You definitely need to have an eye, eye for detail. That's very important. Um, but you also need to have a, a bit of a big picture view because if you just keep your head down and focus on the little things, then you miss the big picture of what, what you're doing it for. And you need to be able to communicate well, um, both within the, within the museum and also beyond, so that we can get the word out there that these collections are here, they're available for research. and. Um, what else do you need to do? Uh, you need to be good with language as well, actually. Even though I'm a scientist, I think it's very important for my role to be, to be good with language, not just English language, but also scientific terminology and being able to rapidly uh, become familiar with all the, all the scientific names of creatures. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so, a lot of people always ask when asking a curator day, what does a typical day for a curator look like? I think... I'm quite lucky because there is no such thing as a typical day. So I generally come into work with a spring in my step. I know I'm going to be doing something enjoyable, um, but even often I find that what I think I'm going to be doing doesn't turn out that way because something crops up that needs more immediate attention than the, the job I thought I was doing. But generally, everything's pretty absorbing. It could be tending to the labelling of the specimens, it could be doing taxonomic research, it could be helping to identify material, it could be um, dealing with public inquiries about what we hold or people sen sending in uh, photos of something they've seen and they want to know what it is, that happens quite a lot, particularly yep. on social media. Yep. Um, it could be going out in the field because we also do our own collecting, very lucky that way. Um, it's, it only happens relatively few days per year but when we do it's um, all hands on deck and we go and collect as much as we can from a specific area usually, bring it back to um, add to the collections. Great. 
Now, now talking of specimens, I can see that you've got a whole lot of specimens on the table here. So yeah. another question, I guess, which we also get for our Scoot Creator Day is, what's the, what's the most unusual thing in, in the collection? <laughs> Yeah, and it's, a, it's hard to know where to start. This is a bit of show and tell I could t t Great, talk let, about. Great, let's do it. <laughs> any of these things here. Um, I guess, well, people like to see the really fancy specimens. So here's a drawer of mostly tropical beetles. Uh, this is part of an amazing collection that came to us from George Bornemissa, who um, amassed this collection over a couple of decades of his life and then donated it to the museum. These. I think I feel these are the sort of ambassadors for the invertebrate world because everybody looks at these and just goes, "Wow!" Um, unfortunately, most of our Tasmanian species don't quite compare in terms of the bright colours and sizes, but we do have some pretty splendid species all the same. So if I can move this drawer aside, great. Um, just just for the insects, one of my special interests is the beetles, which is the largest insect order. These guys are all one species. Um, I like them both, both because of their size, but also because of the important role they do in the forest. So these guys um, chew into um, old trees and then the larvae bore their way through the dead wood. They help to introduce fungi into the, into the tree itself. And that helps create the cavities that then the, um, the nesting birds and possums and things actually use um, and actually need. So, I call these guys ecosystem engineers for the role, important role that they have in the forest. So what do you have to do, Simon, to make the beetles um, look like they are now? Like, what, what <laughs> preparations involved with, with that? The nice things about beetles and most insects is that they have this hard exoskeleton. So um, they actually just dry out very easily. You don't have to do much. But um, you, you can spend a lot of time laying them out as they dry. But generally, for a museum specimen, the, the main purpose is to have the specimen there in the first place. So these just require a pin through them. And then or the all-important labelling, which isn't so apparent here, but um, details of where and when the specimen was collected and by whom and how. Um, the actual a label saying what it is is less important because that, um, that can vary depending on who identified it. And we like to think that we get closer and closer to the right identification over time. But the collecting information never changes. That's a one-off thing, and that's got to go with the specimen for it to have any long-lasting value. And so how long do these specimens last? How long are they preserved for? Well, indefinitely. We don't quite know yet because um, the, 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 the age of science has only been going a couple of hundred years, but there are specimens in other museums which are two or three hundred years and they're still doing just fine. So if they're, if they're well looked after, they're in acid-free containers, they're in a facility like this where the humidity is controlled, the temperature is controlled, then they should last for hundreds of years. So speaking of old things, yeah. what's the oldest uh, invertebrate that we have in our collection here? We've got a couple of contenders. Until recently I would have said it was one of these cuttle bones, not actually this specific one, but um, there was one that was collected back in 1870 something I think and donated to the museum. And, and why I brought this out for show and tell was because um, you never know what the specimens are going to be used for. And when someone collected one of these back in 1870-something, they would not have heard of ocean uh, acidification, global warming, um, uh, what's the other thing else? Oh yes, the technology that we have today. So we had a student, a PhD student, who was delighted to find that we had a whole time series of cuttle bones of this one species, giant, giant cuttlefish, going way back from 1870-something to the present day. And he was taking tiny little cores from the cuttle bone and uh, subjecting these to analysis. And he also injected the, um, subjected the cuttle bones to CT scanning, so medical imaging, which even 30 years ago we wouldn't have thought was possible. And on the basis of that, he's, he's looking at whether the degree to which the shells are thinning as the oceans are getting more acid due to that carbon dioxide. So like just as 100 years ago, they wouldn't have known that this was even a possibility or, or an issue. Who knows what 100 years hence these specimens that we're collecting today are going to be used for. So that's one of the main reasons for having these collections is that for posterity. That's really great. But there is also this one because actually we only found this in the collection recently with a beautiful label on it saying it dates from 1868. So we think this is the oldest invertebrate specimen in the collection. And what is it? It's a giant centipede. I don't know the species. 
okay, was donated to the, um, the, the pre pre forerunner of the Tasmania Museum, really, the, the Royal Society of Tasmania, who, who started a collection, which eventually ended up here at the museum. Uh, and that we, Yes, we know a little bit more about it than that, but it's a giant centipede from the West Indies. <laughs> And so are there a lot of um, items in the collection that you don't know about? Yes. <laughs> um, we, we find that we can keep up to date with all the new material that comes in. We can register it, we can catalogue it, we can database it and make it available online. But getting through the, um, the, the backlog of material that's accumulated over 100 years is another challenge in its own right. Um, we make inroads where we can but we still get surprises like, like this. So we were actually looking for a completely different centipede and we thought, oh, what's this? And there was this guy who's been sitting on the shelves for a long time, obviously. So yeah, the, Id the ideal is to have everything registered and, uh, and the information available online, but that's um, still a bit of a pipe dream. <laughs> And I guess on this same sort of topic, and another great question that um, is often asked of curators on Ask a Curator Day is, what ab object would you like to have in the collection but you don't have at the moment? Is there a, a, a holy grail, if you like? <laughs> <laughs> um, one that comes to mind would be a really nice specimen of a giant squid. A giant squid, as you probably know, is one of the largest invertebrates in the world. And it lives in Tasmanian waters, but in, deep, in the deep sea. And very occasionally they wash up on the beach, but normally by the time they do so, they're in a pretty sorry state. Nice. The birds peck them and the sharks have had a go at them. So we have got a couple of specimens and they sit in these big vats of ethanol, but they look pretty sorry for themselves and we really like a nice fresh one. One that we can put on display, one that we can take tissue samples from for DNA and that sort of thing. So how would you go about getting a specimen like that? Would you have to wait for it to wash up or...? I think it would be serendipity. So you'd either have to wait for a fresh one to wash up and then to be alerted that it was there and we could go and collect it. Or for me, sometimes they do get brought up in trawls. So if a, fish, if a fishing vessel trawled one by mistake and knew what to do with it, so that would be another way. And, and this probably brings us to another really good question, which is how do we get these things in our collection? Obviously, the, the really old things have been donated and things like mm. that, but if you're looking to, to get items in the collection today, how do you go and get them? Do you go and collect them? Or So yes, there's, there's donation, and that's still a very important um, way for material to come in here. We recently had a donated collection of 7,000 insects, which was a wonderful collection to receive, 7,000 Tasmanian insects. Um, but we also go and collect and once a year we try and go on an expedition for a week or so. We call them our expeditions of discovery. Mm -hmm. um, last year we went to um, Tribunner and the year before we went to Muscle Row Wind Farm. And that's a really intensive period of collecting where we can really boost the collections from places, parts of Tasmania that are poorly known and we try and target um, groups of insects and so on that are poorly known as well. That's that's the main ways, I would say. That's the main ways. And, and what do you do with them once you've got a specimen? So say you've got a specimen like one of these, these beetles here, how do you, uh, do you use a trap to collect them? Or? Yes, so you use traps. They're very effective. Um, different traps for different sorts of beasts. Um, some of these come to light, uh, like moths do. Um, uh, other beetles fall into pitfall traps and um, other sort of tent-like structures that um, things fly into. So yes, we do trap things, and then often they arrive in ethanol. Mm -hmm. and sometimes we keep them in ethanol. There's a whole wet collection down that end there, which is of specimens in ethanol. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we dry them and pin them like this. And these cabinets behind you are full of Tasmanian beetles, <laughs> just Tasmanian beetles. <laughs> how how many? So that's a, that's another good question. How many items? are in this collection? I can tell you how many registered items okay. there are, and it's close to 300,000 now. But as we were talking about the unregistered material, it's a bit of an unknown, but I would conservatively say half a million. Half a million? Yep. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's a very impressive amount of things. Now, as we were talking about with the, with the collecting the specimens, that's the, the invertebrate zoology collection is the only collection where you, you're trapping live creatures, isn't that right? Yep, yep, yep. yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, as opposed to our um, vertebrate zoology collection, which is That's right. which has a different method of collecting. But I do notice that you do have some live creatures <laughs> right here. Yeah, well, I was lucky to uh, go on a little field trip yesterday. I don't know whether you can come see these little cute little guys. I've been um, on the trail of these little crustaceans for a while now, and I had an inkling that uh, with this wet winter that we've had, that if there were some temporary water bodies, which is what they like to live in, 
that now would be the time to go and look. So I heard about this billabong up on the, uh, next to the South Esk River. I thought that's going to be the place for these tadpole shrimps. And lo and behold, we found them. They're amazing little critters and a very ancient lineage of crustaceans. Um, they look a bit like trilobites. They're, not, they're nothing to do with trilobites, but they have that look, look to them. And they only, only really survive in these temporary water bodies, so pools that dry out in the summer. And that's probably because if they were in permanent water bodies, there would be fish and other predators, and they don't really have any um, predator avoidance strategies. So when, they, when the pools dry out, these guys lay millions and millions of tiny little eggs that form little cysts, and the cysts can stay in the soil, in the mud, for years and years, and they can blow around, they can blow between pools, and they can get carried on birds' feet to another pool, and that's how they seem to get around and, and survive. So what happens to these little guys now? <laughs> Well, these will be um, euthanized and added to the collection. So um, they will be put in, in ethanol, and they'll, they'll, it's all, all in the aid of science. They'll become another dot on the map because um, once our records are available online, we like to make them available on the Atlas of Living Australia, and there they become a permanent record of what was found where and when, not only around Tasmania but around Australia. And then there are other data aggregators that take that information and put it on a global scale. So. Yes. You can actually zoom in on anywhere in the globe and see what species have been found where and when using museum records such as these. Great. And so, so those kind of active expeditions, I guess, are, are maybe something that people would find surprising about uh, the job of a curator. So uh, what, yep. what, what do you think are the misconceptions, I guess, of your job? <laughs> or what wouldn't people find surprising about what you do? I suppose if people thought of a zoology curator, they would think of it as someone who is always sitting here um, cataloguing stuff. Just for, the, just for the sake of cataloguing. Um, I do, certainly do do cataloguing and I do a lot of identifications, um, but it ha all has a purpose, as we've talked about, some of, the, some of those research purposes. But yes, we do also go out, we have fun. Go out, I, went, I had to um, go out in my galoshes for those and the waders, because the water was that, that deep. And um, yeah, we, we, so you need to know, you need to have good field craft skills mm -hmm. as well. Because I guess a lot of people, when they think of the museum, they might just think of the exhibitions that are on show over in the city site. Um, mm. So uh, obviously the curators, uh, curators like yourself contribute to those as well, but there's a whole other side of the work you do. So, Indeed. So yeah. what, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, well, yes, important as exhibitions are, it is really just the tip of the iceberg of what goes on in the museum. And that's probably more so in natural sciences than anything because the primary function of these collections is to be to make them available for research for the long term. Um, it's great when we do have the opportunity to put things into exhibitions, but as you, as you can see, even the most charismatic of these creatures are rather small, so yeah. having them on display um, effectively is hard. So um, the collections are here for taxonomic research, so people wanting to describe, uh, figure out if there are new species to be described, and there are, there are hundreds in there alone. <laughs> or to work out the, the sort of evolutionary relationships amongst different, say, different mollusks or different beetles or whatever. Or those applied angles, such as the work of, um, this guy was doing on the cuttle bones. There, there's another example here, actually, if we've got time to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're blessed in Tasmania that if, you, if you're lucky on the east coast, if you, if you walk a beach early morning, you might find one of these washed up. These are paper nautilus, which is a sort of brood chamber, the egg, the egg chamber for a, a pelagic octopus. And that uh, bobs around in the oceans. It doesn't really want to be beached, but sometimes they get beached like this. This one is relatively common, but in recent years, this one here has been turning up, which is a more tropical version. So really through having donations or going out and collecting these things, as I've done, both of these are my collections, um, we're learning that more and more of this tropical species is now turning up in Tasmania, and that's consistent with the strengthening of the East Australian current. It's not the only species that's doing that. I could have shown a few others, but um, all of these add to the, the evidence that climate is changing, the oceans are changing. And if we don't have the specimens, you can't actually make, necessarily make those claims that they're just claims. But if you have the specimens, which is really what the museums are about, mm -hmm. anyone can come back and see for themselves. Yes, that was that. Great. Um, and you sort of touched on it a bit there by saying that those um, uh, shells are part of your collection. So 
Now, you were a very clean collector in your own time, aren't you, Simon? Not just for TMAG, is that right? Yes, I was quite obsessed with um, collecting or just understanding, really, the Tasmanian marine mollusk fauna, seashells. So I have written a book on the seashells, mm -hmm. and I did have a personal collection which actually um, has now been transferred here. It was about 70,000 mm -hmm. specimens. They weren't 70,000 specimens like this guy. This is one of our largest Tasmanian species. They were mostly this sort of size, which you can't even see, but if, uh, there's yeah, micro mollusks. You can see a little specimen perhaps in the gelatine capsule there. So the majority of seashells, the majority of mollusks are really small and they're just as intricate if you were to be able to zoom right in on this little guy as you could for this guy. They'll be just as intricate, often with the same similar patterns and, and so on. So yeah, I've long been fascinated with these guys and uh, my collection now resides here, which is where it should be. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think that's, a, that's another, we were talking, when we were talking about important um, qualities for a curator to have, uh, having that curiosity and, and collecting things yourself is a, a good sort oh, of ab predictor. Absolutely, that, yeah, that curiosity. Um, you don't have to be a collector, but I, I would say it helps. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. great. Well, we'll probably wrap up soon, but I, I did want to have a chat to you about uh, the hot topic, obviously, this year, which is the, the impacts of COVID-19. And obviously, um, TMAG uh, closed to the public uh, for a couple of months um, at the height of the pandemic. But obviously, we're open again now, so you can come and visit. Um, but what, what happened? Uh, what, what did you do while the museum was closed? I, I did largely work from home, but um, because I knew it was coming, I was able to gradually take a lot of material home and worked through it there. So I had a microscope set up there. It was mostly the stuff from the previous summer um, and primarily the insect collections that we collected on our expedition of discovery. So I was going to have to work on them anyway, but it was, it was actually a very productive time because I could focus just on doing that without other distractions. And so I got through something like 4,000 insect specimen ID IDs and out of that identified about 800 insect species. <laughs> and they're now all registered, they're back in the collections here and um, they'll be included in our report when we, when we get around to doing that in the coming, coming weeks. Yeah, and I guess that goes back to what we were talking about, is that um, even when the museums close, um, people over here in the Rosny Collections and Research Facility are still working and, and people are still, there's still lots of work to do behind the scenes. Absolutely, yep. <laughs> That's great. All right, well, thanks for that, Simon. We'll probably <laughs> we'll, we'll wrap up there. That's probably yep. all the time we've got for questions today. But don't forget that you can also ask Simon or, or any of our other curators um, questions anytime. Um, so you can send us an email or um, send us a message on social, on, on all our social media channels and they're really happy to, to have a chat to you whether it's identifying um, something that you've you've found on your travels in the bush or something like that um, and also don't forget uh, we have our, our great Facebook live mystery tours uh, which are, which happen um, on the first Wednesday of every month and you can see you can meet some other curators and see behind the scenes here at TMAG during those as well and also don't forget to join us later today for our second um, Ask a Curator Day Facebook Live with um, our Senior Curator of Art, Dr Mary Knights, and that's happening at three o'clock. So thank you again, Simon, for taking the time to chat to us today. Thank and thank you for joining us for Ask a Curator Day. Bye.